Okay, so now we know exactly when an integer is a sum of two squares. So we want to move on to ask how many representations are there to express it as a sum of two squares in this section. So there's two types of representations. First, we want to determine the total number of representations. And then second, we want to ask how many representations are there that are primitive. So primitive would mean that a and b are relatively prime when you write n as a squared plus b squared. And in the process, we're going to observe a nice correspondence between expressing an integer as a sum of two squares and factoring a Gaussian integer in a particular way. And then finally, we want to show how what we're doing here actually gives you an algorithm for constructing all of the different representations of a number as a sum of two squares. So we'll use capital R of n to denote the number of ways n can be expressed as a squared plus b squared. So to be precise, I'll let capital S of n denote the set of ordered pairs of integers such that a squared plus b squared equals n. And so capital R of n is then the cardinality of this set. So for instance, if I want to find capital R of 25, I have to represent 25 as a sum of two squares. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can say it's 3 squared plus 4 squared. That's our famous 3, 4, 5 triangle formula. And that gives rise to how many representations, so how many ordered pairs. Well, you could have 3, 4. You could have 4, 3. And then you can put plus or minus signs on any one. So you could have plus or minus 3, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 3. So there's really eight representations associated with this one decomposition. So here we have eight ways. And the other way you can write 25 as a sum of two squares is a trivial way, just 5 squared plus 0 squared. And so how many ordered pairs does that give rise to? So you could have plus or minus 5 in the first position and 0 here, or 0 plus or minus 5. So this way we're only getting four, four ways of doing it. And so in total, r of 25 is 8 plus 4, which is 12. Now for a prime p, we already know what the answer is. If p is an odd prime congruent to 1 mod 4, then there are, is a unique representation. And what we meant by unique was up to the order and up to plus or minus signs. So r of p is always going to be 8 for any p congruent to 1 mod 4. Because p has a unique representation up to order and plus or minus signs. The value 2, we have r of 2 equaling 4. The only way you can represent 2 as a sum of 2 squares is to use 1 squared plus 1 squared. And again, you can put the plus or minus signs and that would give you four different representations. And then finally, if p is a prime congruent to 3 mod 4, it cannot be expressed as a sum of two squares, and so r of p is 0. OK, let's look at the correspondence between expressing n as a sum of two squares and factoring in the Gaussian integers. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of S of n, so those are the ordered pairs satisfying a squared plus b squared equals n, and the factorizations of n in the Gaussian integers in this form, w times the complex conjugate of w. 
w is a Gaussian integer. So how does this correspondence work? Well, let's suppose you have an AB in your set S of n. So then a squared plus b squared equals n, and you can factor a squared plus b squared as a plus bi times a minus bi. And so you get n is w times w conjugate, where w is a plus bi. And conversely, if you started with a factorization of this form, then you would get n is a squared plus b squared. And so we have a nice one-to-one -one correspondence. And you can think of capital R of n then being the number of Gaussian integers such that w times its conjugate is equal to n. So we're simply counting the number of ways you can factor n and the Gaussian integers in this form, w times its conjugate. Okay, let's do an example. Let's represent 65 as a sum of squares and determine the total number of ways. So what I'm going to do is factor 65 in the Gaussian integers. And so I start by factoring 5 and 13. Okay, so 5 is 1 squared plus 2 squared. So 1 plus 2i, 1 minus 2i. And these are each primes. So this is the prime factorization in the Gaussian integers. 13 is 2 squared plus 3 squared, so 2 plus 3i. 2 minus 3i, again a prime factorization. And so 65 is then 1 plus 2i, 1 minus 2i, 2 plus 3i, 2 minus 3i. And we want to express this in the form w times w conjugate and find all of the possible choices for w. Okay, well, we have its prime factorization, so I could let w be 1 plus 2i times 2 plus 3i. That's one way I could do it. And then the conjugate would be the other two factors. And when you multiply this out, we get for the real part 2 minus 6. And for the imaginary part, 4 plus 3. So negative 4 plus 7i. And that gives me the representation. 65 is 4 squared plus 7 squared. 16 plus 49. Another way we could do it is you could take 1 plus 2i and pair that with 2 minus 3i. Okay, you multiply those two together and we get 2 plus 6, which is 8. And then 4 minus 3 is 1. And that corresponds to 65 being 8 squared plus 1 squared. And those are the two essentially distinct ways of doing it. All of the others are just going to yield the same factorizations up to plus or minus signs. And so we see that R of 65, you're going to get eight ways associated with each one of these factorizations, is 16. Okay, that example has really given us the mechanism for counting R of n for any value of n. Now to do this, we'll have to introduce the divisor function tau of n. So for any positive integer n, I'll let tau of n denote the number of distinct positive divisors of n. So for example, tau of 6 is 4. Since the divisors of 6 are just 1, 2, 3, and 6. And there's a nice formula for tau of any natural number. 
So suppose n is a natural number with a prime factorization, product of pi to the ei. Then I claim that tau of n is just the product of the quantities ei plus 1. And it's straightforward to see this. After all, what does a typical divisor of n look like? It's going to have to be comprised of the same prime factors involved in n. So it's going to be a number of the form p1 to the f1, p2 to the f2, times pk to the fk, where the exponents are, at most, the values occurring in the factorization of n itself. So fi is always less than or equal to ei, and the fi's are allowed to equal zero, so there are how many choices for each one of these exponents? There would be ei plus one choices for each of the exponents fi. And thus, how many choices are there altogether for a divisor? Thus, there are f e i plus 1. Well, there'd be e1 plus 1 choices for f1, e2 plus 1 choices for f2, and e k plus 1 choices for f k. And you can combine any choice with any one of the other choices to get a total equal to this. So, what's the formula for the total number of representations, capital R of n? So let n be a positive integer. With prime factorization, I pull off the power of 2, 2 to the e. I'll let n1 consist of the prime factors congruent to 1 mod 4 and n2 consists of the prime factors congruent to 3 mod 4. Then capital R of n is 0 unless n2 is a perfect square. So we saw that in the previous lecture. So the multiplicity of any of the bad primes has to be even to even have a chance of representation. So if n2 is a perfect square then capital R of n is 4 times the number of divisors of n1. So if we return to our example we just looked at, so 65 was 5 times 13, and so in terms of this factorization here, e is 0, this quantity here is n1. These are both primes congruent to 1 mod 4 and tau of n1, the number of divisors, would be 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1. So the exponents here are both 1's and so that comes out to be 4 and so r of 65 is then 4 times tau of n1, which is 4 times 4, or 16. Exactly what we saw. What would happen if we multiplied 65 by 2 to the k? How would that affect the number of representations? Well, according to the formula, this is 4 times tau of n1. And what is n1 this time? Well, n1 is, again, just the 65. So the power 2 to the k plays no role in the number of representations. And so, again, I'm going to get exactly 16 representations here. Okay, so the strategy, again, for our proof is to count the number of factorizations in the Gaussian integers. So let's recall what we know about the Gaussian integers. So the units are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus i. And in your homework, you discovered that there are three types of primes. 
So zi, remember, is a unique factorization domain. So primes and irreducible mean the same thing. And there are three types of primes in zi. We have the prime factors of 2, and I'll denote them by pi 2 and its conjugate. So pi 2 is 1 minus i, the conjugate is 1 plus i, and 2 is pi 2 times pi 2 conjugate. And notice that pi and pi 2 are associates of one another. 1 plus i is i times 1 minus i. And so when you factor 2, you can express it in the form i times pi 2 squared. So there's really only one prime factor occurring to multiplicity 2. Next, for primes that are congruent to 1 mod 4, you can break them up as a sum of two squares. So p is a squared plus b squared. And so if we define pi p to be a plus b i, p is pi sub p times its complex conjugate. And these two quantities, pi p and pi p bar, are primes. So these are primes in the Gaussian integers. They cannot be reduced any further. And they're not associates. They really are distinct primes. And then the third type of prime you have is if p is an integer that's uh, an integer prime that's congruent to 3 mod 4, then it remains irreducible in the Gaussian integers because it can't be expressed as a sum of two squares. So we have these three classes of primes then. And so we want to return now to the sums of squares and start counting the number of ways we can break it up. So I'll take n to be a positive integer with a given prime factorization, 2 to the e, n1 times n2, as we've done in the theorem. So we've already seen that n is a sum of squares if and only if n2 is a perfect square. So let's go ahead and assume that the multiplicities of all of the prime factors in n2 are even. And so we can write n1 as a product of primes congruent to 1 mod 4, and n2 as a product over primes congruent to 3 mod 4, all occurring to an even multiplicity. So I'll put 2 times fj in the exponent position. And so the prime factorization of n, this first part right here, is the 2 to the e part. And then we'll have primes that are congruent to 1 mod 4, so pi is pi i times pi i conjugate. Let's write it like that. And then we have these primes here don't factor any further. Let w be a Gaussian integer with w times w conjugate equaling n. So in particular, w is a divisor of n, and so its prime factorization is of this type for some non-negative integer e, e sub i, g sub i, and f sub j. So this is just what a typical divisor of n must look like. Now if we want w times w conjugate to equal n, well let's just calculate what is w times w conjugate. w times w conjugate is u times u conjugate pi 2 to the 2e product i equaling 1 decay pi i to the ei plus gi, and then a pi i conjugate to the ei plus gi. Right, you're grouping together the pi i is coming from both w and w conjugate, and then product j goes from 1 to r, qj to the 2, fj. Now, u times u conjugate. Th these are just units, like 1 times its conjugate, negative 1 times its conjugate. This is always going to equal plus 1 right here, so that goes away. And we want this to equal n, so what does that imply? 
that implies that this part here has to match with the, the two part. So what was the, the two component? You have this pi 2 to the 2e times i to the e. So let me just run this and associate pi 2 to the 2 little e. These factors here have to match up. So we're, so we're saying that w w bar equals n now. These have to match up with the factors on n. So pi i to the e i plus g i has to match up with pi i to the little e i associate. And that these multiplicities here, the q j to the two f j's, have to be associates of q j to the two little fj. So they have exactly the same prime factorizations. Thus there is no freedom in the choice of capital E or the choice of capital FJs. So this would mean that capital E must match up with this, that capital FJ must match up with the little fj's, and the only freedom is right here. EI plus GI equals this. So how many choices then are there for the EIs and GIs? Well then the ordered pair EI comma GI could be little EI zero, EI minus one one, all the way down the line to zero EI. Those are the only ways you can have two non-negative integers adding up to little ei. And how many pairs are there? There are precisely ei plus 1 choices. ei plus 1 choices for little ei. Well, for the ei gi pairs, which implies exactly product of EI plus one choices for all of the pairs. And we are done. So the total number of choices is the number of choices for W is 4 times the product, I equaling 1 to K, of EI plus 1. Where is the 4 coming from? Th these are the 4 units you get to choose. And these are the choices for the, the EIGI pairs. And look at that product. That product is exactly the formula we found for the uh, divisor function. So this is 4 times tau of n1. QED. Okay, now some of the representations are called primitive representations. So again, a primitive representation is one where a and b are relatively prime. And we'll use lowercase r of n to denote the number of primitive representations of n. So I'll call r of n to be the cardinality of the set s prime, just like we did for the capital R of n function. So the first thing to note is that a, a representation n equaling a squared plus b squared is primitive if and only if the corresponding representation where we factor n in the Gaussian integers, so n is w times w bar, that's an n right there, where w is a plus bi, then w should not be divisible by any rational prime p. And this is a fact we saw earlier that p divides a plus bi, 
is equivalent to saying that P is a divisor of A and P is a divisor of B. Remember, this is just P times some X plus I, Y equals this. So I looking at the real and imaginary parts, we derive this fact here. And that's equivalent to saying that P is a divisor of the GCD of A and B. So a rational prime divides both A and B if and only if it divides the value W here. So in order to have a primitive representation, we have to find W's not divisible by any rational prime. So returning to the types of factorizations we were just looking at, so we had N to be of this form 2 to the E product PIs to the EIs and product QJs to the 2FJs, and we were looking at Ws, where W times W conjugate equals N. So if I want to make sure that W is not divisible by any rational prime P, I've got to have E to be 0 or 1, because if E is 2, then 2 would be a divisor of W. We have to have all of the FJs to be 0. Otherwise, you've got a rational prime QI dividing W. And you can't have both a pi I and a pi I conjugate. So one of these two values always has to be 0 to avoid having pi I times pi I conjugate dividing W, which would mean that PI divides W. So we have all of these constraints in order for W to be have a primitive representation. So we see in particular that in order to have a primitive representation, N cannot be divisible by 4 or by any prime congruent to 3 mod 4. So how do we go about making this count? So suppose we have a those two conditions satisfied, then for the value W, E would have to be 0 or 1, and the FJs are all 0, and the EIGI is 0. So we have no choice for E's or FJs. So remember, capital E has to be equal to little e. So there's no freedom there. The only freedom comes in the selection of the EIs and GIs. So the EIGI pair, remember, had to have the uh, this feature that it was like EI0 or EI minus 1, 1, one of these guys here. And this time, one of them has to be 0 and the other non-zero. So the only good values would be this one or this one. So we get two choices for the EIGI pair. And so altogether, there are two to the K choices for the EIGI pairs, right, two for each I. And just multiply all those choices together times four choices for the unit. And so you're going to get two to the K plus T K plus 2 total choices for primitive representations, and that gives us the following theorem. So a positive integer has a primitive representation if and only if it's of the form n1 or 2 times n1, where n1 has just the prime factors congruent to 1 mod 4, in which case the total number of primitive representations is 2 to the K plus 2 power. So as an example, let's find all of the primitive representations of 3,250, so which is 2 times 5 cubed times 13. 
So according to the theorem, then, there would be 2 to the fourth, because k here is, we got two distinct prime factors congruent to 1 mod 4, the 5 and the 13. So there should be 16 representations we come up with, which really means two distinct ones up to the order and plus or minus signs. So again, we factor the uh, different prime components. 5 is like this, 13, and 2 has this prime factorization. So we want to break up 3250 as some um, w times a conjugate. And what we just saw, in order to have a primitive representation, we have to throw all of the multiplicity into the choice of w. So when I'm talking about the 1 plus 2i factor, I have to put all of it into w. And so w can be 1 minus i, 1 plus 2i cubed, times 3 plus 2i. Or it could be 1 minus i times 1 minus 2i cubed times 3 plus 2i. And just multiplying this out, we get negative 57 plus i and negative 53 plus 21i. And so we get these two distinct representations here.